Amen. This is the injection of the Lord. Okay. And you started this thing off. Amen. The kids, you may leave for Sunday school. Moira will be with you. Amen. You can have a great time. Great time. I saw some of the materials that were prepared for you for Sunday school, and I know you're going to be enriched in the Lord. Amen. Amen. I leave for Tanzania on, on Wednesday. Please pray because it's an unusual flight. The flight leaves here, I think, at 8 o'clock, Durban. It's connecting at Johannesburg. We will only arrive in, in Dar, in Dar es Salaam, at about half past 3 in the morning. And then my host, I said, Joseph, make sure you're there. <laughs> He's the son of Bishop Mina, who recently passed away. Lovely guy, his son, Joseph. He says, don't worry, I'll be there half past three in the morning. Then we're going to travel two hours to Umlandizi, the land of the bananas. Right? And uh, we'll probably arrive there between half past five and six in the morning. And first session is the same day at nine o'clock. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be a bit hectic. But we can do all things through Christ who who strengthens us. So the church day is in transition. And so we will be um, speaking to the corporate process of that group. Very critical assignment. So lots of responsibility. Amen. Well, let's begin. Today we are going to deal with session eight in our unfolding series on resurrection from the dead. And... Um, Gareth and Lakia did a brilliant job last week, not so, in uncoding the whole concept of death to self or obedience unto death. And they used the case studies of Esther and the widow at Zarephath. And in both contexts, God called um, his sons there to an expression of obedience, whereby they had to deny themselves take up their cross, which is death, and follow the Lord's leading and the Lord's promptings and ensure life, restoration, and the purposes of God prevail at the end of their story. And I will speak later in the series of the whole concept of take up your cross daily and follow me. That's what Jesus said. You die daily. You take up your cross. Not sometimes. You take up your cross daily and you follow the Lord. Philippians 3 and verse 10. Let's just remind you of certain things again. That I may know him in, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So Paul's cry is to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And then he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Just go back to verse 10 again. Uh, these things need to be massaged into your mind and your spirit. So I'm not, I'm not really interested in rushing off to my next subtopic in this theme. The Lord literally instructed me you, to, to pull back, go forward, pull back, go forward. And I want to remind you, this is a key verse in the series, not so? It's Paul's passion. It's the apostolic cry that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. These three things are linked. You can't know him and the power of his resurrection without also partaking, fellowship, becoming a shareholder in his sufferings. And sufferings is the process by which you conform to his death. Because unless you live within the culture of death, you cannot experience resurrection power. Because by definition, something has to be dead in order to be raised to life. So we live in our sufferings in the culture of death to self, death to disobedience, death to to our own ambition, death to our own viewpoint, death to our own opinions. We die daily to embrace the principles of God. The tussle is always God's will versus my will. My way versus God's way. 
my opinion versus God's principle. And we always got to defer and embrace God's way. Let our way be subservient to the way of the Lord. And you might think that you are there, but your decisions tell you whether you are there or not. Experiences reveal to you progressively through time just how far off we are from the mark. When God brings some unlovable people into your world and you're called to love them, then you realize and you struggle with that. That is a revelation for you of just how undeveloped you are in the love of God. Right? So the circumstance, the experience will like a spotlight unveil to you how off the mark you are from the standard that God really does expect from you. What happens when you suffer is that's the part of the, 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 the ambition or the objective rather behind God allowing you to suffer is to open your eyes to certain things that are still, that still need address within you, right? And sometimes a Bible study won't do it, or maybe it has, but you've just not given it due import. Then God has to allow experiences, circumstances to highlight that area that needs remedy, that needs remedial um, address within, within your life. Right? And so I spoke to you about embracing suffering as part of your walk in Christ. Die successfully in that so that the resurrection life of God has the ideal context in which to work. If you leave things unaddressed that your suffering consistently exposes, you're going to develop a stronghold in your life that's going to take supernatural power of God to break eventually. You rather address the thing in its infancy. Don't wait for the thing to grow. Where it's so formidable that now you need major deliverance from it. Right? Don't open the door too much. You might have opened the door. God speaks to you. Shut the door when He speaks. Lest the thing becomes a foothold and a stronghold within our lives that really overtakes us. And I don't want to go there. That's a, that's a whole series in and all by itself. All I'm saying to you is, as God speaks, adjust. As He speaks, adjust. And usually you'll speak through suffering. If you cooperate obediently with every time He speaks through your suffering, what you are going to do is, the resurrection power, the restorative power, the life-giving force of God's Holy Spirit will operate consistently within your life. But if you refuse to die, you are alive, you are alive, and you refuse to die in areas where God says, Die here, my son. Put that attitude to death. Put that opinion to death. Kill that disposition. With it. If you refuse, right? if you're constantly alive, resurrection has got no context to work because resurrection requires death. So if you're always alive, you cannot be exposed to the resurrection and access harness appropriate for your life, the resurrection power of God. In the book of Ruth, we, we, we read routinely um, in the past few weeks. Now we've been reading it privately in our uh, daily reading. Ruth dies consistently through her obedience. She dies daily. Every time she died to self, she created the context for resurrection power to be operative in and through her, in and through her life. Now, in Ephesians 1, just a quick reminder again. I want to remind you of this. In Ephesians 1 and verse 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding or the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Verse 20 is crucial. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead 
and seated him at the right hand or in, in the heavenly places. Paul's prayer here is for eyes to be opened. And he mentions three things. I'm interested in the third one. He says, I want your eyes to be open to the surpassing greatness of his, of his power. And this power he worked or he wrought, he brought about in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead. So it's a consistent thing that you must always pray. When you don't know what to pray for, take verses like this because Paul says, I pray this for you. I pray that your eyes will be open. Say, God, open my eyes to the kind of inherent power that I possess. The power of the Holy Ghost in you is the same power that raised Jesus from the, from the dead. Romans 8.11, just quickly, and I'll remind you again. Romans 8.11, I think it's there. says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit that now dwells in you. Isn't it a marvelous thought that the life-giving Spirit that raised Christ from the dead on that day, that Sunday of resurrection, third day after he died, that same power, Paul is arguing, guys, open your eyes to understand that same capacity lives in you right now, not just futuristically at the last day, but you can know him in the power of that resurrection as a current reality right here and right now. Everyone say right here and right now. Right? And there are many other scriptures linking the, the Holy Spirit's presence to resurrection. In fact, I've got three others here, but I don't want to go there because I want to get to a point for, for, for today. So if you can carry about, just take these references down. I won't read the text. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7 to 12, uh, Paul speaks about having a treasure in an earthen vessel, right? And the very famous, we are, we are afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, not despairing, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in our bodies the dying of Jesus. So when we are afflicted, we are crushed, or we are, we are thrown down, not crushed, etc., Paul equates that we are carrying about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. Right? And if we carry about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus through suffering successfully, we can then carry in our bodies the resurrection, life-giving power of the Spirit that attended the dead body of Jesus and bring things to, to life again. Okay? I want to encourage you, always have the proper perspective of your next trial. So who's ready for your next trial? <laughs> Come on, with everything you've heard, Paul says, I will glory in tribulations. I will boast in my sufferings. When I'm weak, then I am. When I'm strong. So let me just encourage you, for the next rest of this year, whatever it holds for you, right? we're almost half the year now, right? it'll be almost up, Soon, and we're going to start the second half of 2022. Just bump you there and say, how has first half been for you? <laughs> How's the first half been for you? Okay. And we've experienced, as I'm sure you have, many, many varied trials of differing. All I'm saying is the best is yet to come. <laughs> yeah? But you've been sufficiently prepared for it. So you must tell yourself... Through this affliction, I will carry, I will die to whatever I need to die to. I'll carry my, in my body the dying of the Lord. Father, open my eyes to see that the same power that raised the dead body of Jesus, I carry that same dying in my body right now, that that is going to bring forth life and a result and a purpose within your purposes for my life that will far eclipse the difficulty and the trauma of what I faced. In Paul's language, the glory which shall be revealed is an eternal, far exceeding weight of glory. And he says the sufferings of this life 
cannot compare to the glory that can be revealed. Always keep your eye on revealed glory, not, not, not the, 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 the nature of the suffering, the pain of the suffering, the trauma of the suffering. The depth of the pain reveals the height of the glory to be revealed, especially when you're going through intense stuff, okay? You guys there. <laughs> spoke to you yesterday, especially when you're going through intense stuff. You always focus on God. If this is, if the depth of the drama, let me put it in language we understand. If this is the depth of the drama, I can't imagine the depth of the glory, the height of the glory that you are about to be exposed in and through it. Acts 2.24, I want to get to where I want to go. I want to remind you of these things. God raised him up and put an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Thank God that Jesus did not die permanently. Thank God that on the third day, God put an end to agony. There is an end to your agony. I'm going to tell you, and this is my message for today. God's going to end your current trial. All trials are not perpetual. Even the death of Jesus, as agonizing as it was, the, everyone say end. If I was you, I'd highlight this word end in this verse. Because it stands out to me. God is not content that the trial abides, but God will, will designate its time period. And then God says, enough is enough. I put an end to this agony and I will raise my son from the, from the dead. Who needs an end to agony? Yeah? And, and remember this word agony, Odin? Remember what we said it was? It was the pain of childbirth. Right? As painful as the process of childbirth is, when the mother, when the nurses, the doctors take the child and put the child on the mother's chest area and the mother holds a baby for the first time, the joy of that moment by far wipes out the memory of all the pain that brought the child to that point. Yeah? And I want to say this to all of you prophetically. God's going to cause amnesia to you supernaturally. He's going to wipe out the memory of the current culture. The memory of what's going to be produced. Right? He's going to wipe it out completely. What were Joseph's two boys' names again? The first was Manasseh. And the second one was Ephraim, remember? Right? Manasseh means God has caused me to forget. And Joseph had those boys when God raised him to prominence in Egypt. When the first boy came, Joseph says, Your name shall be called Manasseh because God has caused me to forget all the pain of my father's house by the hands of my brothers. How his brothers dealt bitterly with Joseph. Not so? And he says, this boy, this fruit, has caused me to for forget. When the second boy came, Joseph called him Ephraim. And Ephraim means doubly fruitful. God has made me prosperous. And I want to encourage us here. I am, I, I am in my mind and in my spirit tasting a new level of prosperity. Right? I can, I can, it's almost like it's almost tactile. It's almost tangible. I can grasp it. Even though I can't draw a seed in the natural. But it's, it's a, such a forceful reality. I'm now even taking decisions and planning things without money. Buying without money as it were. Right? So I'm reaching out for things. But I, I can sense God is saying, An Ephraimite anointing and the anointing of Ephraim is going to come upon you. Such that it will cause you to forget some of the hardships that you have suffered from the treatment by brothers. How many know some of the worst pain is from family? I'm talking biologically, I'm talking spiritually. God is saying, I'm about to cause Randolph, even if you wanted to remember the past, you will not be able to remember it by virtue of glory that will be revealed. Everyone say resurrection power. Right? I can picture the day when Jesus was raised from the dead. All the, the, the hardship and the agony of a Roman crucifixion. They dragged him. They made him carry his own cross. The cat of nine tails. 39 stripes. 
extracting chunks of flesh from out of his back. Right? Isaiah prophesies about Jesus' back that was the most grotesque and unsightly thing to behold. His back was like a plow furrowed. Right? Think of the crown uh, uh, of, of thorns pierced into his skull. Think of the pressure build up. Think of the insults as he carried that cross up Golgotha's hill. Right? Nails in the hand and in the, the feet. A Roman spear in his side and blood and water flowed. All of that, the Bible says, he despised the shame of the cross. Because he set his face on the joy that was to be revealed. I'm quoting Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 here. Who for the joy that was set before him, he just endured the cross, despising its shame. You know who he had his eye on? You and I. And the resurrection, Paul argues, we are justified by his resurrection when he was raised from the dead. It almost caused amnesia, I believe. Not that God will forget those things. But the memory of the pain, the pain loses its sting when God brings the product. The pain of the past trial loses its sting when God gives the result, the product that the God permitted that process of suffering for yeah and i want to encourage all of us this is what god is going to do god you know i have many other things we could go on here but i'll focus on this because i don't want to rush too much i want to hit target as far as delivering to you what i believe god is saying to you what you must posture your mind for this week and for the next few weeks is that god is going to put an end to the current agony I believe that. God's going to put an end to the current agony. But the current agony is childbirth. Don't focus too much on the pain. Uh, endure the pain so you can embrace the product and rejoice in the glory that will be revealed because of, of it. Joseph must have rejoiced at the end when after he reconciled with his, with his brothers, a whole family all 12 boys, which will become 12 tribes, were preserved by God using him, raising him to prominence as second to the Pharaoh, installing an economic plan, seven years of plenty, saving for seven years of famine. Not just Egyptians, but the whole of the then known world, the lives of people were saved by God putting this man in a particular place of prominence. And not just all people, the lives of Jacob's sons, his other brothers, Judah's life was saved, and from Judah, the Messiah is going to come one day. You will never read about Boaz in the book of Ruth if Joseph didn't do his bit in his time. Joseph preserves that whole legacy, right? You read the scriptures, each significant person used purposefully by God in their era was faithful to the promise, faithful to principle. And this you can track this throughout the scripture. This continued uh, error upon error, person upon error upon person. Now it's your time. Now tell someone, now it's your time. I keep saying, God, I thank you for Joseph. He didn't fail. I thank you for Esther. She didn't fail. I thank you for Ruth. She didn't fail, God. I thank you for Elijah. He didn't fail. The widow of Zarephath. She did not fail. My constant prayer is, I have a rich tradition when I look back at my spiritual legacy and history with all these people. I have such examples. I have a rich tradition. And my constant prayer is, God, in my time, for what I have to do, for what you have to do, may we never fail. So we have a story to tell, successive generations, that we're continuing a legacy from what we've inherited from people in the past, it's true in our time. You must leave your legacy. Right? You must leave uh, a standard for your children and for your grandchildren and for your great-grandchildren. What stories do I have to tell Caleb? Right? I was talking to him yesterday. He was uninterested. <laughs> he wanted to sleep. Levi was interactive. Um, he was awake. I'm thinking, 
what when I see them it resolves my current obedience I'm more resolved currently to obey because I realize I have a responsibility for generations okay for generations so I want to encourage you God is going to put an end to the current agony in the book of Ruth I want to get back there just because we've been reading it and just relate some of these things to her context Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13 yesterday morning's prayer meeting was very anointed it was very purposeful even after I uh, just sat in the office thinking about things and 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 praying again through um, that God will do the things we prayed for um, and in the prayer meeting we, we never got to Boaz's or the city gates of Bethlehem the narrative in Beth in, in the book of Ruth moves well brought it from Moab to Bethlehem the plot moves right, well first Bethlehem to Moab Moab back to Bethlehem once you're back in Bethlehem it moves from Naomi's house to Boaz's field corners to Boaz's table back to the field not the corner center center of the of the field back to Naomi's house Ruth chapter 3 from Ruth chapter 3 end of Ruth chapter 3 it shifts from Naomi's house back to not Boaz's field now Boaz's threshing floor all right the context changes and each venue is quite significant in how resurrection power is working practically in the life of this girl called Ruth and Naomi and from the threshing floor the narrative shifts to the city gates in chapter 4 we Boaz would meet with 10 elders a picture of the law 10 10 commandments 10 elders a picture of what principles what persist in the law that they need to access to ensure restoration by the end of chapter 4 you'll read that there was a whole lot of people there with the gates at the gates too not so Ruth chapter 4 you read only 10 gathered but by the time everyone is prophesying at the end of chapter 4 over everybody and it says and all the people said right and listen carefully Ruth is not at the gates initially right Boaz is your destiny can be sided significantly in areas that you don't need to be present but others will speak on your behalf right there's a proverb which there's a lovely proverb which says her works the Proverbs 31 woman her works speak for her in the gates not so she's not there but she is there in representation and I want to encourage you be faithful because God will speak for you where you cannot speak and God I believe please receive this prophetically you see God is about to put an end to Ruth's agony God's about to put an end to the agony of Naomi and their terrible suffering up to this point they've experienced a measure of relief with provision from the field with provision from the threshing floor it's fine I'm saying to God I'm tired of provision in the field I'm tired of provision at the threshing floor I want security that comes from the gates listen to me very carefully in the field the Bible is very clear she gleaned one ephah of barley not so Anyone say one ephah on Boaz's threshing floor when he said to her take off that outer garment and lay it down the Bible says he filled the garment with six ephahs right so the quantity of provision grows and the quality of the provision grows because on the field you reap unprocessed barley just as it comes off right but on the threshing floor is when the the the, the unusable parts of the grain are separated from the pure grain right it's refined provision okay now, I don't know where you are some of you are still in Moab get to Bethlehem and some of you in Bethlehem are still in the corners of fields some of you are not even in the center of the field yet you haven't gone after the Reaper as we said in the prayer meeting yesterday right where are you some of you haven't gone to the threshing floor because in the threshing floor you're gonna to have to take a risk by sleeping at the feet of Boaz and how beautiful are the feet of him that brings good news how do you value the preacher how do you value the good news of the one that brings Kairos word to you Heroios 
is the Greek word there. The Greek word for beautiful feet. How beautiful are the feet? Heroios, from the root kairos. In other words, it's not just a preacher. Don't think, this is all symbols, eh? Don't look at my feet now and say, has he got beautiful feet? Right? My wife thinks so. You, this is symbolic. It says, how beautiful are the feet of him that brings good news, proclaiming righteousness, etc. Right? The word beautiful there is heroios. From the Greek, kairos. Kairos is opportune time. Oh, how beautiful is the preacher that brings a word in season, in other words. An apt word, a timeless word, a word on time, a word for me. Now, learn to sleep at those feet. Learn to embrace that person. Because there is where you will be not threshed, threshed. Sometimes God thrashes you on the threshing floor. Because what is threshing? Everyone say separation. Everything about Boaz's threshing floor is removing the unsavory parts. You know how they thresh? They usually tramp. Um, and you know, in that culture, I read one commentary which says, it was tradition for owners of fields to sleep on their threshing floor because that process you don't leave to reapers. You see, Boaz can employ reapers in the field, but when it comes to threshing, he will oversee it personally. He's directly involved because that is a refining circumcision process where a father, as it were, separates carnality from his son. Okay? So Ruth goes into all of these phases. She comes home with six ephahs of processed barley. And then it says, uh, Ruth says to her, or rather Naomi says, Rest, my daughter. The man will not rest until this matter is sorted out. Um, you know, and he meets the ten elders at the gates. He consults the nearest relative, closer than him, related to Elimelech offers the guy the opportunity of the what is called the right of redemption. He forfeits that. Boaz steps in um, to buy the land of Naomi to marry Ruth, to raise up offspring that he will never call his own. It will always be called Naomi and Elimelech's son, not Ruth and Boaz's son. He does this all self-sacrificially, simply to obey a Leverite principle that was established in the law of Moses. So, and all the parties involved don't live preferentially for personal interest. They live principally for kingdom purpose. No one is about their own agenda. Everyone is about kingdom purpose and kingdom agenda. So at the gates... Ruth is redeemed. Naomi is redeemed. The land is redeemed. Their status is redeemed. Everyone say restoration. Everyone say permanent end to agony. Now I know some of you, you're saying, agony, I want an end, but not temporary. I want permanent end. <laughs> you see, the gates is a permanent end to agony. Why? Because it was witnessed by covenant. It was legal and it was contractual. There were no documents, but the method of attestation of a serious decision was sandals were being removed. And you know the story. Um, the nearest kinsman took his sandal off and gave it to, to Boaz. By that methodology, it was a law. You, no one could rescind it. No one could challenge it. Right? Whatever happened from that point onwards, nobody could have challenged Naomi as to property rights. She came into property ownership. And how many people need property? Right? I've been doing some work on our property, a little bit odds and ends around the house. And I'm saying, God, I'm in this building mood and mode, <laughs> but I want to build your house. This excites me, but nothing more would excite me than building a house that we, yeah, at Great Ministries Durban Central, could call our could call our own. Who believes that? Amen? And what the Lord, you know, one of the days this week in the reading, and we were focusing on Ruth chapter 4, and I read it again. I don't know how many times I read it. Three words stood out for me. The right of redemption is yours. Right? Boaz said to the nearest, closest relative, friend. Remember you call him friend? And the guy was walking past the gates. 
just happened to be walking. Boaz, early that morning, gets up, sits at the gates. Ten elders, he calls. The guy is walking past the gates. Friend, he said, come here. Come hither. Sounds to be more anointed in King James. <laughs> hither too. Uh, come hither. Right? Friend. Then he explains the scenario. And Boaz says, the right of redemption is yours. You have a right above me. The right of redemption is yours. But in the day that you redeem Naomi's property, of necessity, you're going to have to marry Marlon's surviving spouse called Ruth. He was unwilling to jeopardize his own son's inheritance by that process. And so the right of redemption transfers to Boaz. Now say this loud with me. The right of redemption. Who wants to put an end to the agony of not having our own property? <laughs> right? I want to put an end to that agony. And in the week, God said this to me. If you adopt the mentality of Boaz, to produce something on which your name will never ever be attached, Boaz cannot lay claim to Obed, the son. Not your papa, not your daddy. I birthed you, but you are not mine. You belong to Elimelech. You belong to Na Naomi. God said this to me. And I'm, God said, I'm calling you to anonymity. Calling you to hiddenness. Right? God said to me, you're too frontal. Right? I'm calling you to take a back seat. And produce something without your image on. Produce something after my image. And the right of redemption transfers to you. Now if you can apply this to your own life. If you can just take a humble seat. And whatever you do. Whatever you do in ministry. On social media. Whatever you do. If you can produce something in the image of God. That God can use for a wider purpose that could never be laid, you can never lay ownership to. Produce it, pay the price, you carry the baby for nine months, Ruth, you will have morning sickness, you will have all the pain, you will produce the thing and step back. God, this is yours. Use this obed for your purpose. Right? It's, and the Bible says the boy was taken and put on whose lap? On Naomi's lap. The testimony went out, a son this day has been born to Naomi. If you can produce something that you will never lay claim to, that will be produced in the image of another, be given over to God for His purposes to be perpetuated in the earth, God says, if that's your mind, I will give you the land, because the land, is this, the land and the building will be used to, be, to produce people in the image of God. The land and the building is not an end in and of itself. It is there to facilitate a greater purpose. If the Lord says, don't let the land and the building be the idol. Don't let that be the objective. Let the objective be, let that just be a medium that facilitates the greater objective. That's your heart. God says the right of redemption transfers. Now, that be speaking corporately. For your lives personally. If you stop thinking privately, if you stop thinking me, myself, and I, if you stop thinking only my family and no other, right? if you think corporately, this is a word to all of you, if you start thinking corporately, saying, God, if you give me this, if you give me this, I will use it for your glory. I will use it for your purposes. Because Anything used for the purpose of God, God is obligated to finance. God is obligated to resource. God is not obligated to resource your carnal ambition. God is obligated to resource His global purposes. Not so? Right? And if we can just, I just believe for many of your issues, it's going to take you moving out of private mentality, private thinking, to a more corporate mindset. And God says, see what I will do. Would like to be Boaz in the scripture. I was just thinking today, Reggie, Pastor Reggie uh, um, from Pochepston, um, we were there in the week and uh, we went to pick up Renee's passport. So we spent some time at their home. 
We also went to spend time, time with uh, Jeremy and Carol there, visiting Jeremy's grandma. We went to their home. We were able to uh, uh, spend some brief time and pray with, with Gran. And then we were home affairs there in Port Chefs, and then we spent some time at Reggie. And so I was admiring his swords. There was three sword thing that he had. And he just reflexively gave it to me. He says, well, take it. It's yours. And before I could say what, he took it and put it in my car. Right? So I was showing off with Ray. <laughs> my sword, sister. You know. <laughs> and I got them in my, in my office. And I was thinking. You know, I often think, where would I want to be placed in biblical history if God gave me the opportunity? God said to me, Randolph, I'm going to rewind history. Where would you like to be? I mean, apart from one of the disciples of Jesus, right? We all want to be there right with the master, right? Not Judas, but any one of the others, right? <laughs> Besides that, Old Testament. Anyway, I would, want, I would want to be a Messiah or one of David's 30 men. That's not even David himself. David, you... You do your thing. Maybe one of you, David, I'll support you. I'll be one of the 30. I want to be that guy with the sword that kills like 300 people. I think I'll make a bad, mighty man. <laughs> In biblical history, not now. Please don't get me wrong. Right? Um, but everyone say purpose. And I saw the swords, and they they constant reminder. They're in my office. And it's a constant reminder that consistently wielding the sword of the of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6 says that. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But whenever I see those swords, now I think of David's mighty men. How bad these guys were, and how much they served the purpose of God under David. And they all became mighty simply because of who they served. They even outranked David in terms of military exploits. You know the story? That David, what they did, made David look like a Sunday school picnic in terms of military exploits. But they realize this anointing exponentializes to this degree in our lives simply because of the support we give to this man called, called David. I want to encourage you all. Boaz, Ruth, Naomi, all are so, don't have any personal ambition. They all exist for the purposes of the Lord. And God puts an end to agony. God redeems, God restores. Right? I want to read Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. Right? Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. Let's go to verse 11 first. I will come back to verse 13 at, at the next, next session. It'll just take too long. Time is running away. All the people who were in the court and the elders. Remember at the beginning of Ruth, ten elders only, but by the middle you see all the people. So, everyone say the courts. Say from the gates to the courts. It seems as though, I'm not sure of the context set up of the city structure here. It seems once the decision was ratified in the gates that they move over to the courts where there was a large group of people. So everyone realizes what had taken place. Because when elders gather at the city gates, it's like everyone's waiting for a news bulletin. What major thing is happening here? Huh? What major? Boaz, who has quite a reputation in Bethlehem, is there. By the way, Boaz is famous in Bethlehem. Not so? Obed is famous in Israel, it says. Right? That's another lesson. That's just for you to think. I'm dropping the thought into your mind. Everyone say, think on these things. It says, Boaz was famous in Bethlehem, but Obed, the son he produced, would be famous in all of, of Israel. Right? What does Obed's name mean, by the way? Serve. Everyone say, serve. Yes. Say, servant. Obed's whole thing is, I am not yet to be served. I'm yet to serve another. Right? And if you adopt the servant helper mentality, God will take, and, and fame must be understood in a particular context, which I won't go into now. God will take the scope of the ambit of your influence away from the city and into the nation. Right? But you realize the fame in the nation is built on someone's fame in a city. 
the house of bread, Bethlehem, the word of God, where Boaz would become famous. Let me read this. I'm going off the tangent. I get excited about the book of Ruth. Whenever I read anything in the book of Ruth, my mind starts racing in ten different directions. Do you think it's possible that we have another daughter? <laughs> and we call her Ruth. I'm glad for... Oh, by the way, why Rachel, Leah, my daughter's name is Ray Leah, Pastor Thamo, when... When, Ray, when Ray, Renee was pregnant with Ray, and we're nearing the end, and we were contemplating names for the child, Pastor Thomas was doing a series on this verse, right? And I used to follow him religiously, even travel with him, go to him. We were going everywhere. And I remember once uh, he was doing, he went to put Chepson, actually, with Toffee and Reggie. We were doing a combined thing there. And I remember... And he pulled this verse out. And the moment he, I'd heard it quite frequently now in listening to him all the time. And the moment it came on the screen, like you see here, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses to what happened. May the Lord, they speak to Boaz now, prophecy to Boaz. May the Lord make the woman, Ruth, that is coming into your home, be like Rachel and Leah. Right? That's why you were named Rachel Leah, Ray Leah. So you, you, you Ruth. Right? You must marry Boaz. <laughs> I like to tease her. Right? So it's, 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 here's one girl coming to Boaz's house. Everyone say she's two in one. Jacob married both Rachel and Leah, and together with them and their handmaidens or concubines, gave birth to 12 boys, which will form 12 tribes, which become a nation. So when you think of Rachel and Leah, these wombs got a whole nation, and they represent capacity to produce a nation that would be representation of the church, Right? from whom, the line of Judah, the Messiah would come and bless the entire world. Right? So Ruth is no insignificant girl. Right? When she walks in, it's like Rachel and Leah walking into the room. Two people, two anointings, two configurations in one body. Rachel, as you know, was beautiful externally. She, the Bible records her beauty. And... The moment Jacob saw, he was gobsmacked. He, he, he just fell in love, right? Almost blindly. So blind that he couldn't even recognize it wasn't her when he married. <laughs> and uh, the father substituted the sister. You know the story, right? Leah means one who is weak in eyes but can see prophetically. She represents an internal spirituality that is quite significant. So, and I remember Pastor Thomas' message here, he spoke of the church having external beauty, aesthetic appeal, Rachel. And he spoke about everything we do must be in order, must be classy, must be excellent. Even the way we arrange things, the way we dress, where you keep your grass at home. I must come, I must see Rachel. Yeah? I don't want to come to your car and see last week's chips packet at the bottom there. Right? Everyone say Rachel. Rachel. Right? I want to see external beauty. Right? Clean your home. You know? They say godliness is next to, or cleanliness next to God. That's not in the Bible, by the way. Someone's phrase. Right? But I think it's true. <laughs> okay? Right? Right? Everyone say, be excellent in all things externally. Right? Tell someone, take care of yourself. Care of yourself. Ask someone, when last did you exercise? <laughs> but you want to live a long time. Huh? Ask someone, how's your diet? Are you, are you just eating anything that your eyes get set? No, discipline yourself. Take care of your externality. Be, your body is the temple of the, the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, and everything we do, try and bring a sense of excellence. Uh, you, you're writing an email. Make sure your grammar is properly. Paragraph when necessary. Don't just Boom, 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 boom. We know what's going on in the message, right? Everyone say excellence. excellence. Come on. You see this thing called resurrection power must work practically, right? You become excellent in, in, in all things, okay? 
And then Rachel, or rather Leah, is the one with spiritual strength who has prophetic sight to see. Right? And so you have in external beauty and internal, internal beauty in a sense. Both components are necessary to build a house. Everyone say, they built the house of Israel. Look at Both components build a house, not just one. Both anointings, right? You don't do this at the expense of that. You don't embrace this at the expense of, or that at the expense of this. You need both dimensions in, in one. Uh, many of you spend hours grooming your physical external appearance, but you won't spend five minutes in prayer grooming your spirit. Right? We're more concerned externally, yet the opposite is also true. Don't spend hours in prayer and you fail to bath for the meeting. Right? You need both components. Some people have an anointing twofold, if you know what I mean. <laughs> they have Holy Ghost, but when they lift up the arm, there's another anointing that hits you. <laughs> Take care of your, as your, your, your physiology. Yeah? Take care of your, of your physiology. Amen. I don't know why we're focusing on this prayer. Let me, let me leave that, okay? Now, it says here, both of whom built the house. So repeat this after me. I'm a builder of the house. You see, Ruth leaves Moab, and she comes into Bethlehem of Judah as a builder of God's house, right? Without Ruth's obedience, nothing of God's global purposes are going to perpetuate, even into the New Testament, Right? And they say, may you, may you achieve wealth. This is a, a, test, a prophecy to Boaz. May you achieve wealth in double fruitfulness. Ephrata means double fruitfulness. May you become wealthy. May, may this girl coming into your home boost your economy, Boaz. You're already a multimillionaire, but root addition is going to take these, this thing to a, another level. And may you become famous in? The house of bread. May, you, may your fame be rooted in the word of God. Bethlehem, the house of bread. And I want to encourage all the young people. Everyone, just wave to me, all you young people. Say, how's it? I want to encourage you. How often do you read your Bible? Let me just say this to all of you. And I say this seriously, including the older folk here. Do not, not spend time in God's word. You must become famous in Bethlehem, famous in the house of bread. It's going to be the reason why God will bless every other single thing about your life. Right? Become famous in the house of bread, so what you produce will be famous in the nation. Right? But it starts with your devotion to your Bible must become your best book. However you keep your Bible, most of you have it on devices. It must become your treasure. Uh, more than flipping to social media the moment you wake up, it should be God's Word. Um, I must develop almost an obsession with the Word of God, and you'll see then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success, right? Let's read on. Time is going. Read on. Verse 12. Moreover, everyone say, Nochal. It's like, that's not enough. Now, your house, Nochal, your house is going to be like the house of Perez. That Tamar bore to Judah. We must study this case study at some stage. Because this girl, Tamar, employed some very unsavory methods to get Perez to be born. Right? She was the daughter-in-law of Judah. But her husband died, left her without a son. And she took matters into her own hands. Disguised herself as a prostitute. Right? Judah right. is in the wrong place at the wrong time sleeps with his daughter-in-law, which he doesn't know is his daughter-in-law. Right? Nine months pass. Perez <laughs> comes on the scene. Right? Now, let's look at that account. I want, I want, because of time, I will, I will stop here. Right? Genesis chapter 28, verse 27. What does Perez mean? Come on. Come on. You know what does Perez mean? Breakthrough. It was said, let's say breakthrough. breakthrough. Perez means breakthrough. You know, I heard the Lord in, in trying to find a focus for today, the Lord saying to all of us, God's going to break through significantly. And 
God's going to do it through unusual means, like he got Perez to be born. Perez had to come, right? Perez had to come on the scene of, of time. But Genesis chapter 28 and verse 27 says the following. Amen? 28 and verse 27. This is the account of the actual birth. Okay. Do we have it there, Brahman? Let me get it on my... Genesis chapter 28 and verse 27. Just give me a moment. It's a wonderful account with pregnant, with, what is it, 28? Oh. Does anybody know the account? Is it 27, 28? 30. Genesis 38, 27. My, my error, sorry. So it came about at the time she was giving birth. Now, may your house, please, why are we reading this? Because the prophecy went out to Boaz. He's going to marry Ruth. And the prophecy says, may this house be like the house of Perez. Perez means breakthrough. So you must understand Perez technology to understand what Ruth is coming into. The restoration of Ruth is not just like be like Oh, by the way, Ruth is better than seven sons, right? She is like Rachel and Leah in one body. She comes into Boaz's house, and the house is like the house of breakthrough when this girl comes in, right? So this is, I always ask myself, what were the origins? What happened at the moment of the birth of Perez? It came about at the time that she was giving birth. This is Tamar. That behold, twins were in her womb. Moreover, it took place that while she was giving birth, one put out a hand. And the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Right? Because firstborn status was a, uh, an important issue in Jewish culture. Which one was born first? That one has the right of firstborn. So one of the twins put his hand out of the womb. Right? Like he's like a racist on it. I'm yeah, I'm first, right? And so the midwife ties a, like a thread around to indicate firstborn, right? But it came about, the hand is out, and he draws the hand back in with the scarlet thread. He drew the hand back, and behold, his brother came out, the other guy, pushed him out of the way, said, I'm coming first here, yeah. right? Right? I'm out first. Then the midwife said, What a breach! She's talking to the child as though the child can respond, right? She's almost, there's an exclamation mark here. In the King James, it's a question mark. King James says, how have you caused this breach? They say, what a breach have you made for, your, for yourself? And so he was named Perez. So the breach becomes a breakthrough. Perez breaks through, right? And then in verse 30, it says, afterwards, the other guy with the scarlet thread, he comes out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was Zerah, right? Zerah means seed. Perez means breakthrough. If we read, let's just go back to the King James. I think it's the King James. Go to verse, uh, the, um, go to about verse 29. Right? Look at what it says here. It came to pass that he drew his back his hand, and behold, his brother came out. And the midwife said, How is it that thou hast broken forth? Breakthrough. Right? The NASB says it's a kind of a breach because you don't have this right of firstborn, but you have broken through to attain it. Right? Everyone say question. Now the baby can't answer. She's asking, How have you done this? <laughs> he, can't, he, can't, he can't articulate. Right? The way we read this spiritually is if he had the intelligence to answer, he would have told you what took place in the womb. He would have said, It wasn't really my breakthrough. I'm experiencing this breakthrough because my brother acted as a seed 
for my breakthrough. My brother was the seed. I've entered into the prosperity. My brother was the seed. I'm just taking my harvest for something I did not sow. Firstborn strictly means the one who breaks the womb. That's what firstborn in Hebrew culture is. The one who breaks the womb and opens the womb for more sons to come, to come forth. Perez is firstborn, but he only experiences firstborn because Zerah was the seed for his breakthrough. Right? Now, everyone say breakthrough. Now, I, w- I want to encourage you with some of these thoughts. God's been saying to me, Randolph, you're going to break through into areas that perhaps your context determined shouldn't be your portion, but you're going to reap where you haven't sown because of your brotherly disposition. You are brotherly, you're loving, you're concerned about relationships. And the seed of the brother will be the seed for your breakthrough. If you're not brotherly, you will not have the breakthrough. You must have a zera that is your twin, as it were. And you come into breakthrough because of the seeds in your life that are brotherly in character. Some of us love nobody, but we want breakthrough. Some of us take care of nobody, but we want breakthrough. Brotherly expressions are seeds that will bring into your world a harvest of breakthrough and prosperity that I believe God is going to richly, richly bless you with. Yeah? The, the tomb became a womb. Remember we did this in Jesus' day? An end to the agony, childbirth produced something. And I want to encourage you all. God is going to bring a bursting forth. It's going to be violent. You're going to come, not, when I say violent, not aggressive, it's going, to be, it's going to be forceful. It's going to be quick. But you're going to enter into pathways and portals that others have been, for, others have been there first. But God will accord it to you because of your disposition towards a brother called Zera, a brother which you regard as my seed. Now ask your neighbor, so where is your brother? Ask your neighbor, am I my brother's keeper? Your breakthrough lies in how you care for brothers. You can track this throughout the scripture. David did not wake up one day to kill Goliath. He didn't say, today I'm killing a giant me. Wake up five o'clock, the alarm goes, no. That day, his father said to him, go see how your brothers are doing. That's all. He took cheese, raisins to his brothers. When he got to the battlefield, he saw a giant. When you prioritize brothers, God gives you breakthrough to kill giants. And David never ever went back to sheep from that day. From that battlefield, venues change for David like it did for Ruth. He was transferred from the battlefield to King Saul's royal courts. Who needs a change of scene? Uh, you're saying, I'm tired of my current venue, my spatial sphere. I'm fe- actually feeling bored with my life right now. I need something drastically to change. God must change my context. Key is how do you care for brothers? You take Joseph. How did Joseph land up in Egypt? His father Jacob said to him, take this food to your brothers in Shechem, remember? Or Dotham? And go see how your brothers are doing. When he got to them at the second location, they decided to sell him into slavery and pay a free ticket to destiny to Egypt. Yeah? You never know what God has in store when you start to minister and empower brothers. You're there to feed brothers. But that brotherly disposition in you would be the seed that there's there are that you need to enter your personal breakthrough. When last have you thought of anybody from outside of yourself? Yeah? When last have you thought of helping another? Right? When last have you thought of inconveniencing yourself so that my brother can, can benefit? Everything is locked up with dying unto self and accessing the breakthrough 
but I believe God has for you. Who's trusting God for breakthrough? Yeah? It's in God, resurrection, power, and breakthrough. I want the music.